and we're pick, uh, picking on topics that are going to attract the different uh, uh, different communities. We hope that that, that works here. We're going to try that uh, uh, to be a, a, a future mode of doing things. So the 1882 Foundation is uh, just a quick introduction. Is that 1882 comes from the 1882 Exclusion Act, and we are an educational foundation that tries to uh, uh, promote uh, awareness, uh, education, and awareness. And people are watching on Twitter, <laughs> so that's okay. And we're a pretty informal group, but we try to pick on interesting topics. Um, so uh, let's, uh, uh, we're going to try to do this this way. We're, one of the things we've done is we try to do it as a sort of a gallery fashion. So that instead of just having talking heads, you'll be able to see who's in the audience, but everybody will be muted except for the speakers and the, most, the speakers are here in front of me, plus Larissa, who's calling in from, from Los Angeles or San Diego. <laughs> Somewhere in California. Somewhere in California. Uh, <laughs> so we're gonna be doing that. So all of you guys uh, will be muted, but there'll be what we would like to encourage you to is use the chat function frequently. Oftentimes we would like to say, hey, you notice who's online? Give them a shout out, say, hey, this is, uh, uh, this is Jerome from Washington DC. It's great to see you here and uh, that sort of stuff. We also want you to continuously ask questions through the chat. And one of the things that I'll be doing is monitoring it so that, so that when we uh, are into our discussions, I can bring out your questions as if you're also chatting with us as well here. Uh, first, they're saying they can't really hear it too well, so maybe speak up a little bit. Okay. They're chatting with you right now. Okay, <laughs> everybody said I thought it proves. All right, so I'll, I'll have to speak a little bit louder. And uh, uh, so we'll see how that works. Is that going to work? Everyone, how's the sound? Not so great, but it's okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay. That's okay. We're not yeah. going to say anything important anyway. <laughs> <laughs> or we can say crap in it. <laughs> but in any case, uh, the topic is uh, uh, between uh, bl uh, black and white. And we're going to be talking about a couple of, of films and uh, made by producers here. And we'll introduce them later. But before we go on, uh, I just wanted to introduce uh, Amy. What, uh, we are doing this. Uh, we're doing this with the MLK Library. And so now she'll just maybe make a few statements to welcome everybody here. There's your camera. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone out in internet land. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you so much for coming and welcome to MLK Junior Memorial Library. My name is Aime. I work um, in adult services here with Jen, who's outside welcoming people. Uh, we're so happy to be here hosting 1882 Foundation. Um, as Ted Tadak said, between Black and White, uh, Chinese and Jim Crow South. Um, so as he said, there's some tech involved. Uh, we have our virtual audience as well as everyone here at the library today. And I'd like to briefly introduce our moderators and panelists. Um, this is Ted Gong, the executive director of the 1882 Foundation. Uh, Jerome Page, our local historian and policy analyst, uh, Crystal Clock, director of Blurring the Color Line, as well as film producer Baldwin Chu, who's here, and Larissa Lamb, who's online, um, who are film producers for the documentary Far East, Deep South. Um, so this event is conversation style, as Ted mentioned, and we look forward to all of you participating during in the discussion between and after the film clip screenings. Thank you again for coming and I'll hand it back off to Ted. Thanks. Thank and uh, one thing I wanna remind the audience is that this program is being live streamed and it's being recorded. You'll be able to see it after uh, uh, afterwards uh, uh, when we're done. And uh, that'll be through our 1882 website and you can find it there via YouTube recording. Uh, that being said, for those of you who don't want to be seen or recorded, then make sure that your mic is always on mute and that your image is off. Uh, so I also wanted to acknowledge some of our sponsors. Uh, the 1882 Foundation always gets great support from uh, Chinese American Citizens Alliance, OCA Asian American Advocates, uh, Chinese American Museum in DC. And also in this case, we're 
our sponsor today. We're happy to say that uh, Panda Express is helping us to support this program. So uh, what I would like to do is that uh, we've already introduced the panelists. Uh, 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 and maybe what we'll do is I want to show an introductory film first, and we'll run that. And then uh, afterwards, on the other side of that clip, we'll talk a little bit about some of the history of Chinese, America, Chinese in, in Mississippi. And then we'll go on. We'll be following that with other clips that uh, the film producers have produced, Crystal and, uh, and Baldwin. So let's run the, the first clip. It's an introduction. It's by Dolly Lee. And it's actually on the Food Channel. But I think it, it is a very good introduction to uh, uh, the uh, Chinese in the Mississippi area. This community has played an unexpected In the first part of this series, we learned about how San Francisco's Chinese fought exclusion. In this part, we'll visit the Mississippi Delta, where Chinese community has played an unexpectedly important role. The Mississippi Delta, home of the blues, endless fields of green, and a land cultivated by the hands of slaves. But in between, for more than a hundred years, the Delta has also been home to a small but influential Chinese community that's been navigating an identity that's both American and Chinese. This is Sally and Gilroy Chow, and this is their 46-year-old walk. We heard about these dinner parties they throw to get together with friends and eat Southern-style Chinese food, like fried rice with lots of bacon. So we decided to go meet them and find out how their families ended up in the Delta. This is a store that I grew up in many, many years ago. We lived in the back of the store before we bought another house. Like most of the Delta Chinese of the time, Sally's parents opened and ran a grocery store. The Chinese originally came here to work in the cotton fields. With the end of slavery, plantation owners could no longer depend on the free labor of slaves. So they looked to the Chinese, who were cheap, disposable, and politically voiceless. But with harsh conditions and little pay, working in the fields didn't last long. They soon started opening grocery stores in small towns up and down the Delta. I mean, it was a phenomenon. When I think about how, how the, the Chinese came and just settled in the Delta from Memphis to Vicksburg, I mean, just look at it. It really filled a particular need because nobody else wanted to do it. These stores played a uniquely important role in the segregated South, serving the black community when the white community wouldn't. And this was significant because it meant more than 70% of the population got their groceries and everyday goods from a tiny Chinese community. Frida's family store in Min Sang started out in the 1930s as two different buildings across the street from each other, one serving black people, the other serving white people. Neither black nor white, the Chinese community found themselves in the middle. It was like a three-lane road. Um, there, there were the whites and the blacks and the Chinese. We all stayed in our lanes and we were fine until we crossed over. <laughs> the Chinese grocers depended on the black community for business and also served them in very practical ways. Like when Jean's father's customers couldn't pay for their groceries right away, he let them use credit. People didn't have that much cash and so he would have credit and they would come in one week, pay a little bit on their bill and take out more. And that was just kind of how they survived. This kind of trust was essential because of the economic burden non-whites faced. Where Jean grew up, the median annual income for whites was just over $4,000, more than four times the median income of non-whites. 
Over dinner, Sally and Gilroy's friends had plenty of grocery store memories to share with me. What was the worst? Mop, the mop in the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday night. <laughs> when you were old enough to be able to see over the counter, many of us started working in the store. It was just expected of us. Living and working alongside our mom and dad was seven days a week, morning until night. I mean, even Christmas Day. They open 365 days a year. You know, there's one thing I didn't even realize. During the Exclusion Act, the Chinese were not allowed to own property, so they lived in the back of their stores. Even when exclusion ended in 1943, many families couldn't afford to buy a new home. We lived behind the grocery store, one big room divided into two rooms. We didn't know anything else, so we thought it was kind of fun. But you know, as we went to school and realized people had homes, we thought, well, that's different. When it came time for Frida to go to school, it was the first year that the town she lived in, Greenville, allowed Chinese children to go to white public schools. Prior to that, all the Chinese children had to attend this one-room schoolhouse. Some of these schoolhouses were built by the Southern Baptist Church, which remained a big part of Delta Chinese life. Lord, we just ask your blessings on this food, bless the hands who prepared it. Even with their busy lives between the store and family, the Chinese still found time to get together for celebrations, dances, and of course, food. There was a definite camaraderie with the kids uh, in the Delta. It could be a birthday party or a wedding, whatever. They would have a uh, dance. We all just loved getting together, and the food was always phenomenal. Here we are. We're all lonely in the grocery store, and there is absolutely nothing to look forward to. And, and so you can imagine that, I mean, he, here, here was something, a social event that the Chinese could, could really look forward to. For many years, the community thrived in the Delta. But over time, as more farm jobs were lost to machines, unemployment increased, and so did poverty and drug use. Chinese-owned grocery stores became easy targets. My brothers, I mean, th they have been victims of, of uh, two armed robberies within the last few years. Luckily, they have survived. We just don't even wanna, we just don't even wanna think about it. Today, most of the Chinese grocery stores are closed. The end of the Exclusion Act brought new work opportunities and the original grocers fulfilled their duty of working every day of the year to send their kids off to college. Many of their children grew up to be pharmacists. Some served in the military, like Sally's brother, Audric, and Gilroy worked on multiple Apollo missions for NASA. But even though they've been here for so long, the Delta Chinese are still often seen as outsiders. I had an occasion to where I was walking into an office building and some dear little lady said, honey, she says, are you ornamental? And I didn't quite know how to answer her. And I said, sometimes. It happens to me all the time, you know, like, how long you been here? Or who taught you English? Because are, are we the are, are we're always foreigners? I mean, that's that's a great question. I think about that myself mm -hmm. all the time. Are we always foreigners? Mm -hmm. Because of our because of our appearance, because of our appearance, we just look like we just got here. I mean, we don't look like American people. <laughs> Despite these interactions, for the Chinese community here, the Delta will always be home. Oh, Audrey, why do you love it out here? It's so peaceful, you can't, I'll turn my cell phone off and uh, so I'll just fish and uh, nobody's calling me. It's just solitude, enjoying God's creation. <laughs> Sally, Gilroy, Jean, Frida, and Audric. These friends are some of the few Chinese left in the Mississippi Delta, but they remain a close-knit group gathering over food to preserve the memory and legacy of their families. The Chinese American people definitely made a contribution in the Mississippi Delta. They came and they definitely made a, a big contribution here. They did. 
like this episode on the Mississippi Chinese, check out the next one on San Gabriel Valley, where new immigrants are completely changing the restaurant scene. Even Chinese people think they have the best Chinese food in America. Okay, so that's a quick, uh, okay, so that's a quick introduction of uh, the Mississippi uh, Chinese and the Mississippi Delta, and maybe very some I like some quick reactions from you guys in terms of uh, how did that match with your perception of the place and society, the setting of your films? Well, um, I mean, obviously with our film, Far East Deep South, um, it was in the Mississippi Delta, so we we were able to interview Frida, who you saw there, who got that beautiful southern twang. Um, we we had we had dinner with the, with the chows as well, um, and it was just uh, yeah I love I love the film because it it is a nice summary of everything, um, and it, it captures a little bit of what that experience was for the Chinese community, especially during that time. Um, what we were excited to talk about, like with our film, when we get into that, is how we we're able to expand that that summary and um, talk about like what led to those incidents. Mm -hmm. I don't know, if Larissa, you can chime in a little bit on what, what your thought are, what your thought is. Oh no. Yeah, I mean, I love Dolly's. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, no, I love Dolly's piece. I've seen it a, a few times, and I think, you know, I got very nostalgic looking at everybody there because that, you know, when we as Baldwin will mention earlier, I mean, later, I should say, um, we, we didn't know what we were getting in ourselves into when we took our first trip to Mississippi. And now seeing those faces, they are like family and um, being able to sit uh, with those conversations. Um, and I think they really only just scratched the surface about some of the hardships, I think, that they endured. Um, and, you know, a lot of a lot of history that has never been told. And so I'm glad we're diving into this conversation. Yeah, I just want to jump in and I'm glad you mentioned Frida's accent because every time, like even I show my clips and there's a Southern um, Chinese, people who don't know the Chinese in the South get blown away. They're like, what is that? They've never seen the combination and they don't assume that Chinese have can have Southern accent. So that's a kind of a cultural anomaly in itself. But I think also about the connectivities that speak to both of our films and to Dottie's and to anything about the South is the way the Chinese immigrant story worked, right? The struggles or the kind of the preservation through food. There are all these so many common conversations that link all of our stories together. Yeah. Uh, Jerome, any, any thoughts or impressions right now? Yeah, I had some, a couple of thoughts and it's, it's a thought that has, has stuck with me ever since I saw Crystal's short clip you sent me maybe a year ago. And this whole concept of physical closeness, but yet social distance. And that's a theme that you see. So you have the Chinese physically within the community, but socially distanced yeah. from both the blacks and socially distanced from the whites. Yeah. So those are the questions we're going to get into as we go on. So a couple of questions from the chat, please. I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure that uh, uh, Dolly is correct in saying she made the comment. She made the comment that the uh, Chinese could not own land or property in Mississippi. I think that varied from state to state, and even up to in Arizona, even up to today, there are some uh, laws that prevent Chinese from owning stuff. But I think that that varies from state to state, and I think that people did. It also varied time to time. So yes, in the, time in the time. early stages, yeah. yes, it was yeah. how they started. So when Chinese first came into the land, 1870s, right? When they started showing up in Mississippi and probably even in, in Georgia, when they started in the late 1800s, there were laws that prohibited Chinese from owning property. And that, uh, that would carry over in a lot of the Japanese story too, Japanese American story. But I think the ownership of land and some of the issues that we talk about simply uh, that affected the Chinese from coming in and why did they own grocery stores? All of that relates to immigration laws, I think. So at this time, when people are starting to move in in the early parts, you have the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? And the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, excluded laborers. It allowed for merchants to come in and diplomats and students. So if you were able to get a business license, a shop, a grocery store, and you're classified as a merchant, your family, other people got that same uh, status. 
So if you have one grocery store in the neighborhood and you could build two or three and you have, uh, that gives incentive for more people to come in and build these stores. So uh, one of the interesting phenomena is if you go down to Greensville or Mississippi, you find grocery stores within the same block, the same. Yeah. And, and it's in, in, yeah, in, yeah. in your places block, too. It's like a 7-Eleven. Yeah. So I think what it is, is the immigration law at that time allowed the merchants to come in and use your advantage yeah. to get that. So we can talk about that. Uh, but keep in, in mind if that opportunity was created because whites didn't, the blacks were consistently denied the opportunity. Yes, so yes. It's an institutional vacuum. Yes, yes. It opened up for Chinese Correct. to fill. And that, that filling, that vacuum has caused tensions yes. uh, ever, ever since. Right. Yes, right. we should get into that right. more too. Yeah. And the idea is that uh, in that period of time, and you have, uh, uh, you can't count on the black laborer. So you started at one point thinking that Chinese labor will replace them. But that did, what happened then is that Chinese laborers figured out that they had some capital and some other things that they could do with shops. And there weren't the shops or the large white, white businesses to, to service that group. And the Chinese came in and filled that, that, that gap. And one of the things you were talking about in terms of credit was important too. Yeah. Yeah, because um, I mean, they were in a time where so when when the Chinese, I don't know if we, we'll get into it later too, but when the Chinese first came to the Mississippi Delta, they were there, like you said, to replace slave labor. Right. So you had Chinese and black um, sharecroppers working together on the fields, and actually it was um, what we understood when we found out during our research was there were commissaries that were actually in on those plantations. And those commissaries were like ripping everybody off because they're like, man, we lost slave labor. Now we got to pay these people, even though sharecropping once or twice a year, we still got to pay them. So let's rip them off with the commissaries, right? Yeah. But then Chinese Exclusion Act happens, right? And now you have this incentive to like get rid of your Chinese labor because we don't want Chinese labor, right? So what are the Chinese going to do? And they're, they, they're forced off the lands, plus they weren't, they're getting ripped off anyways, right? Now you have black people back on the plantations getting yeah. ripped off at the commissary, which is the only place they can get groceries. The Chinese were like, well, we can maybe find a loophole and go into groceries too and charge a whole lot less than the commissaries. Yeah. And now we will serve the black community and we'll do it at 0% credit because we know what it's like to only get paid once or twice a year. Yeah. You know, so and, and the 0% credit, I mean, if you use modern terms, it's vendor financing. You want, <laughs> you want people to buy your product, yes. so you finance. So that's that's a that's a modern technique to to move product. But they have to have the means to finance it too, and that's the distinguished why a lot of uh, black community members weren't able to create or open up their own stores. Sure, and I think the the, the role of anywhere there was a small shop created. Yeah. Maya Angelou in her biography. Yeah. Our autobiography, I know why Case Percy, talking about her grandmother owning a store yeah. and not only extending credit to the black laborers, but she always financing the white community as well. Larissa, do you want to chime in on any of this? Yeah, I mean, we also heard of instances, um, you know, in our film, and I think in our in our clip later on, you'll meet Mayor, uh, former Mayor Daryl Johnson of Mound Bayou, um, which is one of, one of the first um, independently run established cities that was all black um, in Mississippi, and you know, they actually had told us that the chi there was one Chinese store and they rented from the black community because the black, the black community in that case owned all the property because it was an all black city. And so there are a lot of instances in history where um, there was a reliance going the other way where the Chinese needed to rely on the, the, the black community um, to have some pathways to commerce as well. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to add, like, there were some nuanced situations that we don't really see, too, is um, I learned that there were some Black-owned stores, but the customers tend to go to the Chinese-owned stores. Why? Because they had more produce, they had more stock, and they were able to afford refrigerators that contained better yeah. quality things. Yeah. And so that kind of, like, reinforced yeah. that, that position. Well, you I mean, that's a good point, because if you want to open a shop, you got to have the capital. Shop. Yeah. You're just recently freed black labor. Where do you accumulate yes. capital? Yes. What banks are going to give you 
that. Exactly. For the Chinese, uh, if nothing more, they have problems too. And, but they are actually relied on clans and family associations. So they were highly them. dependent on multiple yeah. families exactly. helping to, yeah. in the beginning, when they weren't owning the stores, it was to rent the store out and they yeah. would ship in multiple families and they would take turns yeah. borrowing money from everybody. Yeah. And it wasn't like today, small business owners where you can go, yeah, I'm just gonna borrow a bunch of money from the bank. I'm gonna have this capital. I can afford to give you one or 2% labor in, or interest free or zero, just borrow money. It wasn't like that, right? It was set up for a system that Chinese Exclusion Act didn't allow that loophole to say like, we want a loophole so Chinese people can succeed. But they, that loophole they was to, difficult. They yeah. were hoping that Chinese people would be like, it's even harder to run a business. And it's not just family right? they borrowed from. They're like, you know, it goes back to the paper son issue. Yeah. A lot of them were not relatives yeah. and they went over there to help out with these stores. Yeah, let's uh, let's talk about that further. But what I'd like to do is show the following to them and just sort of like begin also to continue sure. this discussion yeah. with some visual things. Uh, can we start uh, showing that clip? All right, so this is the trailer to Far East Deep South. Yes. Growing up, it was always kind of a mystery about my dad and his side of the family. Whenever my brother and I would ask him about my grandfather, he would just say, oh, it's a sad story. It's, it's not a big deal. One day we came across this photo of a gravestone, and that's when my dad finally told us that this is where my grandfather and great-grandfather were buried. But not in China, in Mississippi. Chinese people in Mississippi? What happened there? actually don't know where we are going and where we're going. Last thing I thought I'd ever find in Mississippi was a Chinese museum. I guess there was more than just my grandfather and my great-grandfather. When the Chinese first came to the Delta, they were treated like we were. Everything was very segregated. I mean, it was black, white. We were just really in the middle. I had to attend a segregated one-room schoolhouse. Growing up, I read about segregation, and I, I thought that it only affected the black community. I just didn't really think that it would happen to the Chinese, too. What? Great-grandpa! Oh, my God. It is so important for people to know what happened with the Chinese Exclusion Act and how it affected Chinese Americans throughout the nation, including the South. So that's uh, that's that's Far East Deep South. Um, oh, why make yeah. a joke? <laughs> yeah, why'd you make a joke? What, what motivated you to do that? Yeah, uh, I mean, when we first went to Mississippi, it was really a family journey. And actually, I was just gonna make a, a family home video, thinking, oh, okay, we'll just maybe find a couple of Chinese dudes buried here. You know, we found that, that, that my dudes. yeah, <laughs> well, it was my grandfather and my great grandfather. Right, we knew that they were buried. We found out that they were buried in Mississippi. So let's just go and check it out and maybe we'll find them, right? And then maybe we'll just throw some flowers on there, pay our respects, tell our daughter, have a story for her and then go home. And when we showed up in Mississippi, everyone started coming in. Like when we went to the museum and I think that's where, Larissa, you can like, 
Larissa's job originally was just to be mom. By the way, me and Larissa are married, so, so she's a director of our film. Uh, just just to be clear, so she directs not only the film, she directs my life, so she's the director. <laughs> um, so I call her director even when we're not in the film. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, but, you're, I mean, no, she no you're not. That's Mrs. That's Mrs. Director to you. <laughs> why don't you film why you um, decided to override me and not make it just me? <laughs> well, um, I, you know, going back to Dolly's piece of introduction about the Mississippi Delta Chinese. So I had an, I, I don't think she had actually produced it at that point um, when we went to Mississippi, and I had never heard um, a about the Mississippi Delta or actually even, you know, about the Chinese in Georgia and other places, um, you know, like where Crystal's family. And so we went in there literally thinking, as Balda mentioned, I'd find two Chinese men buried, his grandfather and great grandfather. And then we step into that Mississippi Delta Chinese Museum and we see all these artifacts and all these articles about this population of Chinese that obviously had to be significant to warrant a museum. And then I'm starting to read about segregation and the impact it had on the Chinese and how they weren't allowed Allowed, uh, many of them were not allowed to go to white schools and how they had to be buried in separate cemeteries. And I grew up learning history. And as an Asian American, I, I be honest, like I didn't like history because I, I think part of it was because I didn't feel a personal connection to it. And we all learned about the American South and nowhere did I ever read about Asians being impacted or even being there in the same chapters of American history that I learned about. And so for me, that was very rev revelatory. And the fact that now I kind of felt a, a, pers a, a stronger connection, especially to the black community in the sense that clearly not as, not as the same legacy as slavery, but there is that Jim Crow South that we occupied that time period together living symbiotically. And so, you know, even though there were social constructs of that time, um, that put everybody in their place. There was a very symbiotic relationship that we learned going to Mississippi, Mississippi Delta, especially when we went to the smaller town of Pace, Mississippi, which is where Baldwin's grandfather and great grandparents store was, much smaller town that was very tight knit. Um, and I just wanted more people to know about this history and also to kind of combat those issues of us being perpetual foreigners, that there is a long legacy of Asians in America that stretch not just on the coast, but all across the country. You know, you know, Christo, uh, as a film producer, actress, producer of things, uh, mostly in Hong Kong, talk shows and so forth, how is it that maybe you can react to the reasons which Bowen created this film? And right afterwards, let's show a little bit of a clip of that. Yeah, film. well, writing off of Baldwin and Larissa's film, it's yeah. really interesting. Mine too started from a very personal place. And that's how stories evolve, right? Um, I was very close to my grandmother and my grandmother had a Southern accent and, um, nobody knew about her past you know they don't talk about their stories but she would tell me that she uh ran away and wow you know a 16 17 year old chinese girl running away in the deep south during jim crow is a, is a story in itself so i decided to dig and i went there to visit and mike baldwin and larissa going there for the first time and meeting relatives you've never met before and and, and covering deeper bigger stories that it, it, it evolved into something bigger than me Right? I had to address the race relations because maybe nobody questioned what did it mean to be Chinese between the black and white. It wasn't really that simple. We weren't all structured clearly. There were lots of intersections and entanglements that brought us into very complex relationships that yeah. we can talk about. Yeah. Why don't we show a couple let me, of years? Let me ask yeah, a question please. from yesterday. Uh, when was, what year was Grandma Pearl uh, born? 1911. 1911. Okay. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's yeah. do this. Let's continue the discussion of the side of your film, uh, your, your little clips. Okay. Let's get this going. Show. Uh... Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. In the segregated South, Buses were separated, black people in the back, white in the front. Where do you think the Asians sat? My grandma Pearl, she moved with her family to Augusta, Georgia in 1927, where they ran a grocery store in the black neighborhood. What did it mean to grow up Chinese in a black and white space? 
Now, when I was growing up, the expression, we had a Chinese grocery store in every corner. You know, the laws at that time were so limited, but not applying to, to the Chinese. Segregation was nothing more than a pseudo way of carrying on slavery. How did they end up in the black neighborhood? They are still people of color. You can only go so high. They were allowed to go to the predominantly white schools, whereas blacks were not allowed to go to the predominantly white schools. And at school, there were mostly white kids? Did you feel, all, did all you white feel? Kids. All white kids. They How did that make no you feel? Minuting, no minuting at all. The Chinese, you know, there's some of them that they don't want nothing to do with the blacks, but they yet they want their money, you know. They play the blacks against the Chinese like the Chinese were a little better than the blacks and the whites was a little better than the Chinese. That's the way it went. The black people in Augusta are tired of being told that there is no racial problem here. Now the nation knows that Augusta has a problem. Why did during the riots did the black community take on the Chinese community and destroy the stores. Were they too close to Caucasians? And too far from the blacks? How are we going to move forward if we don't address the past? I'm sorry, you guys need to unmute. There it goes. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you. So you, your grandmother was born again in 1919? 19, 19, sorry, I had yeah, okay. to clarify yeah. that. Yeah. Right. So they moved to San Francisco first from the immigration trail, right? Okay. And then because of the need, they started moving over to places like Augusta. That's right. where, yeah. The reason, reason I asked that because in terms of why it's paralleling, yes. so my mother was born in 1921. Okay. So got basically a trajectory of, of the same number of years growing up in a segregated right. situation. Right. In the case of my mother, it was in uh, of Virginia. Okay. So the interactions there. Now you raise a question of why 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 did the um, as a result of the urban rebellions and so forth did the Chinese, some of the Chinese stores get burned out? And, th and this is this is one of those complicated. Uh, situations, because even though the stores were serving a purpose, and even though uh, the black community of ostensibly economically is not at advance as others, they became a wealth building capacity for the Chinese merchants. So no matter how poor black folks were, they were creating wealth for someone else. And and you can see that you you could see that in your film yesterday. When you looked at the older uh, uh, women, because yeah. mainly they were the ones who right. were the survivors, the, the dignity which they dress, the appointments with their jewelry and their yeah. clothes, they had advanced economically while the black community was still where it was. Right. And so this is, this is the thing about poor communities. People think there is no wealth in poor communities. It's just that the wealth gets sucked off and not recycle back into the world. Right. And that's what we talk about disenfranchisement is that the black community was left, was always kept on the bottom that we don't send to address. Correct. And, and so as part of the being the shop owner in that complicated situation, yeah. while the narrative is that the Chinese merchants were providing a service, they were also perpetuating a system of racial apartheid. So and then it gets complicated, not just in the terms of, of the South, but small business owners, you know, whether it's under communism or capitalism or authoritarian, they always play that nebulous role because they're providing a service, but they're also perpetuating the system. And that's why there are two things I wanted to mention, if we want to open it up. Um, to, to Larissa's point about the symbiotic relationships, I want to say yes and no to that because there are lots of silent spaces where we don't like to admit or to even bring that up, that it wasn't really symbiotic in many places, that we don't, we, the Chinese side, don't acknowledge the uh, position of power 
even though it was we worked together as friendly neighbors, there was still this underlying tension of racial hierarchy right. that I think we need to address. Right. And I, I, I thought about Isabel Wilkerson's book, Caste. Yes. And you can see how a caste system is, is perpetuated. Yeah. About things said, rules followed, so that the, the order was maintained. By who? Like who created this order, right? Well, well, we, we know in one sense the post-slavery, uh, the denial of the promise yeah. of, re, uh, of, of quote unquote the 40 acres and the mule yeah. is that this, the enslaved were free, but they weren't giving any resources, right. unlike the serfs in Europe and yeah. other places yeah. where once they were liberated, they had resources to build. So what you had was as soon as the South was able to to end reconstruction, they try, as you pointed out in, in your film or some of the comments there, is that you try to then reestablish slave labor and came under the format of Jim Crow. Jim Crow. And, and so that 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 is that is part of so there was no there was no challenging of the system. And I'm not I'm not being critical, but there was an acceptance of the, of the system and the role that you play in it. So that's 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 the something that we need to talk about. We need to talk about it and we need to bring up the concept of the model minority because it is a role. It was created to pit the communities against each other. And that's a later thing that happened as time progressed too, right? Because yeah. if you yeah, talk about when it first started, yeah. right, there was no model minority in the 1800s quite yet, right? right? That, right. that, that sentiment came later. Yeah. And yeah. Sure. go ahead, Larissa. No, no, I, I mean, and you can piggyback off of this, Baldwin, but yeah, I mean, you know, and I, and I agree with what, what you're saying, um, because again, back to context of history um, and time period, I think is very important because, you know, in our interviews with many members of the communities in, in Mississippi and with scholars, you know, a lot of the Chinese were actually viewed as lower than the Black community when they first entered the Delta. Um, in fact, there is a writing from a, a plantation owner um, during that time um, who wrote, wrote a memoir, William Alexander Percy in 1941. And he actually commented that the lowest of the low, he wrote, were the Chinese shopkeepers who dotted the small towns of the Delta. Um, in so far, I can judge they serve no useful purpose in community life. And so they, over time, as you can see, they did end up having, gaining more favor, having up more, more having some more upward mobility. And in some sense, a, a, a unintentional byproduct of the Chinese Exclusion Act enforcing Chinese to do that loophole of a merchant was, as Jerome mentioned, you know, gaining um, some, was able to gain some economic status over time um, in the long run. Although in the early, early years, as we've heard from many people in the Chinese families, it was very, very difficult. It's, you know, it's it was working to the bones, barely being able to make, um, I don't know if Stan Liu is there today, but uh, if Stan's there, like I remember he was mentioning, you know, they were just making pennies, get it just getting by. And so not every store was the same, some were more successful than others. And so, um, and I just also want to point out that, you know, and we're talking about these things and I you know, it's hard to boil conversations down um, with all the nuance. Geography does matter, time period does matter. And to also show that not all the Chinese in the South were the same, you know, even the same block, there were nicer store owners than, you know, not so nice store owners. And so these are all kind of the nuances that, you know, I know we'll get into more discussions, but hopefully we can learn some of those lessons. Again, it goes back to who was in charge, who was dictating, you know, who could succeed and who could not succeed, right? And it was the dominant white society systems of power so, and I'm glad oh sorry no go ahead but Larissa I'm glad you mentioned that because um in when I was trying to do my research and interviewing people where I asked random people where they thought the Chinese sat on the bus right the segregated bus because we don't think about that position and to your point some people actually thought oh did, were they even allowed on the bus they thought they were like even further back from the black position we just had no clue there's no concept of the Asians because they didn't exist in our black and white mind right yeah, so that's one of the things that you talk about there is even in our title, we say between black and white, but it's not necessarily that uh, stark. There are shades of different things in between, right? And so the dominant issue that you have to think about is there's a white sort of stratification or that uh, whites are, uh, how do you maintain that prejudice and how do you keep these sort of uh, groups in, in, in line? And if you're, you're coming in, there's the lowest you want to avoid and there's a high issue aspire to. 
So if you're coming in the middle somewhere, you want to be able to have enough or ability to equal the top people, in that case, the whites. But then, in this other, and you want to be able to avoid, in some cases, I was reading where they say, the condition of the blacks was so bad that you wanted to avoid that position, right? So you began to separate yourself from the blacks as well. So you can be there to do transactional things like business and so forth, but you're not going to do, as mentioned in some of the film, that you're not going to really socialize or become a part of Right. It. Yeah. Not so that's a problem. And one thing we learned even from the black community in Mississippi and some of the historians from Mississippi was that there was a white citizens council that manned the streets, that they were like, okay, Chinese people can live here in the black community, but they would walk the streets to make sure that they didn't do anything other than transaction. They would watch them and, and it, would, it would be a, a strange way for, so they weren't political people, but they were hired by the political people to maintain the separation to stay in their lane. Like what Frida was talking about, like you need to stay in your lane. Once you cross, there's trouble. Well, that was because there was a white citizens council that made sure that they stayed in their lanes, that you can be here in the middle yeah. and maybe we'll treat you a little bit better right. as long as you don't wait, lean the other way and start hanging out, right? And that's why even when we talk with, and maybe we'll show that clip um, from, uh, Maybe we show that first, and we can talk sure. a little bit more yeah. because uh, we can hear a little bit more about from the black community about like, what was their experience, right? Not just hearing from, from yeah. me or from from the Chinese. So we can show that two clips, right? One from you and one. Well, we can we'll do ours first, yeah, and then we'll, we'll do your second. Yeah. One thing to keep in mind. Yes, the black and white. From, I like no, that, just one. Yeah. So we show that clip. And keep in mind, it's not just a binary black and white. It's never. That's why it's blurry. <laughs> it looks like we're blurring the color line here. Yeah. The Chinese and African American communities have grown very much together over the years. All of us, the Chinese and African Americans, like the same food. Because, you know, black people love Chinese rice. <laughs> and Chinese began to utilize the hog in the way that the African Americans did. Um, I was surprised to find out that their store was in, in the middle of a predominantly black community and that pretty much their entire client base customers were black. There was a small group of Chinese that came and opened stores in Mountain Bayou, Mississippi. That was groundbreaking because there were no other races that did that. And even unto this day, no other races did anything like that. Only the Chinese. They had a competitive edge in one sense that uh, a lot of the blacks didn't feel particularly welcome in the white grocery stores. I would say we had better experiences with the Chinese families here than we did most of the white families here. Growing up in Mississippi in the 40s and 50s, there were certain people we knew to just stay away from. The Chinese people mostly was people that made you feel welcome and at home, and we didn't have to be afraid to be around them. The blacks had a respect for the Chinese. The Chinese didn't make them feel as a second-class citizen. Welcome by the Chinese yeah, and you know, this was a time where, and, and even in the film, we talked a little bit more about like when Chinese were finally allowed to be more white and sit at the bottom of the theater, right? Uh, we hear uh, this more stories from our film, it's not in this clip, but when Willie, Willie uh, talked about how their, black, their Chinese friends would purposely go to the balcony and continue to sit with their black friends. Mm. Right, and that was like, a, I almost, I was crying during that interview with him because I was like, wow, why aren't we hearing these stories today, right? These are stories of a small community where there was, I mean, the history of America was horrible at that time, but they found a way to, to, to be together, right, under those circumstances. This is whole question of social distance and physical proximity. Uh, I have a, a cousin who, 
before my age, but he's practicing law in Brookfield, Virginia. And he's serving both black and white clientele. So one day he turns on the television and he sees one of his my clients of KKK route. <laughs> so the so next time the client comes to the office, he says, well, you know, why, why, why are you here if you're out there? And speaking to my cousin, he says, well, you're different. He knew this person at one level it was no longer a stereotype. And so he could relate to my cousin as a competent lawyer, but he was relating to other blacks as a stereotype. And so you get this juxtaposition of social distance, physical proximity, and how that can both help and distort things. Yeah, that's a good point. Just like, you know, we're talking all a lot of times, especially more recently, about how our communities are not monolithic, right? We're talking about the Deep South here. But we're talking about different regions. We're talking about different time periods. We're talking about even individual relationships, right? Where, where, where you know, maybe Willie had friends that were Chinese that would go to the balcony with him, but then he probably also had friends that were Chinese that would not, right? Yeah, but I want to say right? that because in my family they did not, they did not encourage or they did not allow for my grandmother's sisters to be friends with their black neighbors. Right. Yeah, and and see again, that's a mon that's it's yeah, different. So Your it's area stories. is different than the area in Mississippi, in that small town where uh, I guess Augusta is the largest town, right? It's more uh, a little metropolis. But I mean, Pace has how many people? Is Pace 300? Uh, three hundred? Three three hundred, and it's more rural. I mean, you know, definitely Augusta in comparison would be considered, you know, more more urban. I think many people in your film, you know, mentioned that. And at the same time, I think as a society, going back to what Jerome was saying, there's this societal expectation, and whether people, you know, believe the stereotypes and general generalizations, right? Like, you know, stay away from certain types of people, whether it's white, black, Chinese, you know, like there there people may say that, but on an individual level, once you get to know the people, and Baldwin, share about the Hosey Collins, um, something right. we wish we had put in our film that we didn't discover until after a film was you know, completed was we had we had found this photo of a black gentleman in Baldwin's family's um, photos, and we always wondered who this man was. Yeah, so Hosey Collins, we found out after the film was completed, and, um, and we had continued uh, discussions with Mayor LeBron Jackson, and there were opportunities where um, at that moment, black people had more opportunities than Chinese at that time period. So China, but black people could not go to the banks to borrow money. So they would do these backdoor deals with the Chinese grocery stores. And they knew that they had, they could get something from them, whether it be, you mentioned the 40 mules, the 40 Wait, acres in a meal. Right. And Mayor LeVon Jackson mentioned this to us as well, saying like there were clauses that said that if we did not maintain that land, that land would be taken away from us, right? So how can we have, how can we tend this land without shovels or whatever, right? We can't borrow the money from the banks. So he tells us that they would do partnerships, backroom deals where the, with the Chinese grocery stores. And, and this would be under the table, nobody knew about it. And he was like, okay, I'm telling you now, but no one else talks about it. And they would do like a 70-30 a, like a split. Black people keep 70%. Like they would just say, we'll borrow some money from you. We just, just give me that barrel. Give me that shovel. Give me a little bit of money to buy a mule so I can tend this land so I don't lose it. And we'll do this partnership. And maybe then your store can survive a little bit better. And we can survive a whole lot better. Because at that time, Black people could actually own the homes. That's why the Chinese lived in the back. They could not own the homes. But so China's like, oh, well, you guys have houses you can live in, but we can then live in the store, right? So this was this, the Black the black community said, let's get these underground deals. Don't tell the white people in the banks we're doing this because we know those white citizens council is watching us, right? So Hosey Collins, which who we found out um, after the film was, was he was one of those people. He came into my grandfather's store and he was working in there, right? And in the, and, and for trade, my grandfather would go to his farm and work there and they would work together and be like, I'll give you this, you give me that. I got this, Harder. we're together, right? Nice. And my great grandmother kept that photo because she said to my dad, this man Hose, who was short for Hosey, was a good man that loved our family. He loved him and, and that's all he knew, right? It wasn't until we went back to Mississippi and then started talking to the entire community, the, the 300 people of Pace. Somebody's gotta know somebody, right? And they finally told us, oh, his name's not Hose, it's Hosey. 
And, but you, but I do remember when we were kids, there was this family and they were like this group of people that owned the farm. This black man owned the farm next to the base. And yeah, we would do that, and, right? And these were stories that we just felt was so compelling. Like, why don't we know these stories that show that we have worked together? We have done things together. Why does it always have to be like, we were bad, you were bad, I was bad. You know, Because it goes back to Loressa's point about um, history is created by people in power, right? So the history books we learn from schools that control and frame all these black and white narratives, we don't get the small stories. Right. And this is why we're here. That's why we need to change that story, right? Yeah, how do we shift things? Yeah. I think though you do have to understand that larger, that other issue where you say that the white domination is there, right? And they and they're going to the laws and stuff are going to be against this sort of uh, individuals who are sharing this sort of group. I mean, let's go if we if we go back to saying uh, let's look at school districts, let's look at uh, a couple of places. I think Carolyn and other people. They could not attend school. They had to go to their own, their own schools and yeah, segregation and so forth. And so I don't know how many people understand there was actually a uh, one of the first cases about the segregation was actually in Mississippi, Mississippi. by a Chinese uh, girl trying to attend a white school. That case went to the Supreme Court of the 1927. In 1927, they ruled against they lost. Lost, uh, the, the Chinese. Long versus, uh, versus, versus Rice. 1927? You know? yeah. yeah. But I think it's very interesting that the arguments that went through it was not through the 14th Amendment that eventually became uh, uh, the law that set Brown versus Brown versus Board. Versus yeah. board. Uh, it was based on some state laws and some other things of this sort. It's interesting, I think, that I've always wondered why didn't the Chinese also argue for the black students as well? But they were only advocating for Chinese to be allowed to be considered white to attend white schools, right? So in that case, uh, after that decision, there was a lot of more reason to compel the Chinese say, if I want those benefits like better education, I have to be more white. Right. That then begins to put you, pit you against the blacks, the other people. Like that. Yeah, there, there, there are the stories of how, how the Irish became white. <laughs> yeah. So, because when they first came to they the United not. States, they were not white. Right. right. And the Italians and the Italians. Right. Yeah. And so, this is whole process of how other immigrant groups become white, but the African Americans. Uh, can't become white except for those who are on the passing. Maybe they're yeah, yes, they exactly. passing. You still have right. shades. Yeah. So there are those who are able to to pass, and so so the that, that, that further exacerbates the differences and creates the tensions. And is that every struggle. every everybody else can become white? Yes. Well, maybe yes, maybe no, because then you also have a, uh, the South uh, South Asian group of people. So, so it's colorism. Uh, it's like depending yeah. on the shade of your skin. Or, or, yeah, and that's a that question of who is white enough to become American, right? right. Why is that even there? You know, like so. But the uh, the structure, the social structure, the political structure, the judicial structure is forcing those choices, right? right. They could have made that decision. You've all heard of the paper bag test, right? That's all clear. What's so I don't know, maybe you're not the right to, to, <laughs> no, to explain this one. <laughs> but basically, that yeah, right. yeah. So that was, <laughs> no, that was, wow. that was a social hierarchy within the black, based on skin color. Uh, within the black community. Within yeah. the black community. Yeah. Yeah. So in order to get into certain social circles, you had to could be dark. Isn't that uh, crazy? Was it a recycled bag or a recycled bag? Can you all hear, by the way? I'm sorry. We have like a nice yeah. audience. Everybody, yeah. I want to encourage everyone to ask questions and raise your hand and comment. Yeah, even within yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've got some questions in the chat, but I mean, just to kind of piggyback off your colorism comment, I mean, I know, Crystal, you introduced that a little bit in your film, and, and, and there is colorism within the Asian community. Um, you know, and my mom would tell me, and part of it was, um, it was, you know, partly, I think, with the white being the model of, of, of power and color. However, there was also this classism where if you were dark, that mean you worked in the fields, 
you know, in China. You were not part of the elite because obviously if you were wealthy, you would be inside and so you would be fair. And so, yeah, my mom is not a huge fan of Baldwin appearance initially because he's very tan for a Chinese man. And so, you know, she kind of was like, oh, really? Like, you know, I think he's tall, dark and handsome, but my mom likes the pretty boy, you know, you know, K-pop, the K-pop looking, you know, guy, right? Like, (laughs) (laughs) Um, so those are very interesting how culture to culture colorism plays a role. Gender too, Larissa, now that we're here, like, why is it okay for guys to be darker, but girls have to be more fair? Wait, are we allowed to be darker still? I don't know, know, because I'm dark and I'm like peasant class, but like, you know, (laughs) Yeah, mothers want like the girls to keep fair and the guys are okay to be play outside the field. I don't know. It's it's more acceptable. Yeah, I mean it's more acceptable for like you know, they want everybody to be fair, but definitely for the women, because then you won't be marryable, right? Like they're gonna think you're a lower class like woman and no one's gonna watch you. Well, doesn't colorism tie into ideas of purity and things like that and, and status and yes. you know. Yes. And that goes back to miscegenation laws, going back to Jim Crow. Miscegenation laws was there to keep in place the purity of the white, white race, yes. right? Yeah. And one of the interesting things, too, is that you have uh, things separated for whites and blacks and browns and things of the sort. But you have poor whites who are on the lowest, yeah. should be on the lowest scale. And then uh, if you look at it socially, economically. And so what happens then in some cases is that you want, if you're at the lowest part of the scale, you always want to go upward, right? So you would target some of your prejudices against those other colors, right? So then you have certain people that uh, will say, okay, let's be anti-immigrant. It doesn't matter who they are and so forth. And the question of coalition building. So why not ally with the Asian, the lower class Asians and then for or the non-accepted Asians, and then the Asians aligned with the, the uh, non-accepted whites and build up together. So that's what happens finally in the civil rights period. So or, the or Asian for a brief period. And that I think is then the 50s and 60s when we're talking about civil rights movement. There was a lot of Asians beginning to realize that this coalition really is important. The question then is how long does that sustain itself? And do we can we still keep that going now or not? There are but a lot of evidence. Do we only do it until we get a little bit of what we want? And then we're like, okay, well, like, because that's not a real relationship, right? We can't, we can't have these fake relationships where we're only having in this relationship until we get what we want temporarily. Yeah. And then when we no longer need each other's services, then we all back off again, right? So how do we maintain those? So do we have- Does someone have a question back here? I thought it was- Yeah, I saw it. Oh, no, that didn't work. Mm-hmm. Oh. Go for it. Oh. Yeah. Yell it out. Okay, okay. I'm still going to sit with the camera. No problem, no problem. Um, first off, um, can we hear the outside here? She'll repeat it. Really? So first off, your work, um, Learn and Clear Lines, it highlights, it highlights areas where um, I did it, right? But it's a blurry line. Um, if you look at me, you wouldn't know that this is my son at, at my birth. And you wouldn't know that my dad is the same shape, which this is. <laughs> so I lived on a blurry line my entire life, and because of where I lived, my parents were on the blurry line. Um, we weren't in the city, we weren't in the outskirts, so we were either being controlled by somebody brown or black. Um, there wasn't really any mixture with, with Caucasian, there wasn't really any of that, so you were definitely, if you were of color, you're going to come from a place of color. So I really commend the work that you all are doing because it highlights those conversations that need to happen in order for us to go forward. I think I'm going to take this down because uh, how do I explain my family just by, you know, and also why do I need to explain my family? You know, first, you know, that's, that's Notice that in the film, there's a three to five generations. 
that across the line we have to find that language to speak it. So we no longer have to have these types of settings or whatnot. So so I commend you guys and, and that's my question and comment. Thank you. Wow, that's good. How, um, Reese, were you able to hear any of that? Or no, you're not question? here, Pete. I think, so, yeah, somewhat, I mean, just kind of asking about, and correct me if I'm wrong, like the language that we need to use to convey these messages to help the older generation or even younger generations understand and hopefully not mis make the same mistakes. Is that is that correct? Kind of? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's just passing in that movement. You know? yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Do you want to repeat that, Baldwin? Or, or, the, or did I did I interpret that correctly? I yeah, didn't hear what she said last, the last thing she said. Passing. passing. Or about passing. Yeah. About white yeah, passing. Yeah. Like, yeah, passing. Yeah. Well, the, can I just say, like, the idea of passing is already very problematic, right? And that's why we're talking about it. Um, and for, for the Chinese community or Asian community, it's like, what does it mean to be white adjacent? We always have that topic. And I want to maybe, so that's a, what, have you heard that before? Oh, white adjacent. Side side. Yeah. So it's right. like, you're not them, but you're, just you're like yeah, them. you're never going to be white, but you're trying to strive to be passing to be closer to white in order to stay up on the social ladder as to not be on the forever bottom side of the black community. Um, and maybe it's a good time to share my clip on model minority because I feel like this addresses why why we are, what is this whole model minority bullshit? Because it's created to make us justify that it's okay and we should be white adjacent in order to be in a higher place. Oh. Yeah, thank you for- Yeah, I would I would just add to that. I'm oh, sorry, was somebody asking? There's an audience who wanted to comment too. I just yeah. wanted to add another question and observation. Oh. So some of the, some of the, the, the footage shows cemeteries yeah. uh, with flags. And so my question is, you know, Jim Crow endured for a long time. At what point did Jim Crow begin to diminish from impacting the Chinese uh, in the South? Uh, when, when did, did you, it did was you hear that? I mean, okay, so the civil rights, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer both. I'm gonna add on to the last question about passing and and then Anne's to kind of move into that. Um, so with the the idea of passing, um, I just want to make the point, especially in the last two and a half years with this pandemic where we saw the rise of anti-Asian sentiment. I think that's where, to Crystal's point, this is where being accepting being white or white adjacent, or even believing that you're in that comfort zone went out the window because clearly the Chinese, a lot of the Chinese community said, hey, if we buy into the model minority myth and just do what do do what we're told, we'll be, we'll be fine, we'll be safe. And clearly at the end of the day, people still saw us as Chinese or Asian and couldn't even, you're Korean, everybody said the same and we were not immune to racism and discrimination and violence, you know? And, and so that's, that's where acknowledging and having this conversation that there are distinctions of our history, of our character and, and issues, but also acknowledging, you know, that we shouldn't be pitted against the black community, that we actually share a, a lot of history in this country, but acknowledging and, and, and that was and that was my thing with the film. It's like I wanted to have a, the black story in our film, one, because it was organic to the storytelling. But I know somebody that's Chinese or Asian may not watch a Spike Lee film or Ava DuVernay documentary, but they may watch my film and they'll hopefully have some more empathy and feel something different than the stereotypes that they have seen on TV or through rumors and through cultures of people in the black community. And so I think it's up to us to open these conversations and make sure that we we understand the distinctions and those nuances. And to the Jim Crow laws. So 1964 was the end of the civil rights, I mean, the, sorry, was the, the passing of the Civil Rights Act. 1965 was the passing of the, National, the Immigration and Nationality Act. And it was kind of 
after those passages that you started to see, you know, again, in general society trying to integrate some of those stings in Jim Crow starting to go away. It took some time, you know, as you know, historians will tell you, and it, it differed from city to city, state to state, how some of these things were rolled back. Um, I remember talking to Gilroy Chow, um, who you saw in Dolly Lee's, um, he was the one that was making all those, uh, like uh, the pork on the grill, <laughs> um, grilling up the, the pork. Um, and he was saying like, at one point he was not allowed to join any of the country clubs because he was he was Chinese, you know, and at some point, and I don't know if this was the 70s or the 80s, he was finally allowed to join the white country club or so um, it depends. Yeah, so I think that the question that when it happens, of course, and there's another question about the involvement of uh, Chinese and Asians in the civil rights movement. And of course, it's the civil rights movement that, that makes it makes a difference, whether or not that continued words, I'm not sure, but also your intimation of, say, flags and so forth. The participation in World War II made a difference. So the fact that you had the Japanese Americans who wanted uh, being one of the most decorated uh, uh, Italians there also. Uh, and then the other part would be, uh, most recently, Chinese Americans were awarded uh, Congressional Gold Medal for their participation in World War II. So all these stories is what's not being told. Gilroy, I think it's amazing, actually, Gilroy, uh, and who is seen cooking. And what you remember is him cooking the walk and stuff. He was involved in Apollo 13 and the rescue of the flight coming back to, uh, to the United States. So when there's an interesting uh, film that talks about him and they show a clip from the movie Apollo 13, how I remember that film, but they threw all that stuff on the table. It says, we got to bring our guys home. And, uh, and they, we, this is all we got. We got to do it. Gilroy was involved in that. And yet, no, there are no Asians at all in that movie at all. So we talked about it. So the way we tell the stories, how we bring them out, is important. The more that we have those stories told by you guys or everybody else, that's, that's what we want to show. And so that's a, it, I would like to say that it's a continuing process, so that it could be sort of gradual. But the whole purpose of what we're doing here to make sure that people understand that Chinese Americans and Asian Americans and others were part and parcel of the United States history. And we shouldn't let the uh, dominant white narrative uh, come. Dominant white narrative, that's what we're all talking yeah. about. And I thought that Stan yesterday on our, my screening asked a really important question of whether why I chose to leave out the white narrative. And I thought that was interesting. And maybe this leads to this clip because this, is a, this, this, this clip is about the First Baptist Church, mm -hmm. um, who was the white community who allowed the Chinese to come into their space and to distinguish. Remember, we talked about how Chinese were not allowed to go to white schools. That was in Mississippi, but in Georgia, it wasn't. The church allowed for the Chinese to go to white schools. Well, you know, even within Mississippi, not far from where Margaret uh, 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 Walk was, they varied from. Right. So, so they would move yeah. different parts of this because different cities would have different rules. Different right. Parts. And people think all the South They're is the not same. the same. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's show that. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 Um, all right. I, I hesitate to say anything, <laughs> but, but probably as the only person in this room who really lived yes. in Mississippi during the Jim Crow era, you know, that's me. No, so I, I don't know. I just feel like I have to say something. I don't, I don't want to take your thunder. Away. No, please do. But I lived in the Jim Crow era. I grew up there in the 40s and 50s. And you know what? What you what you uncovered in your movie, the two movies are, are great, and because they show what happened. You know, it, it touches on a lot of what happened here. Uh, and what, what happened to me was, you know, I, I feel like I experienced all of that. I was the yellow peril, the, 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 the yellow immigrant, yellow skin, slant eyes who couldn't speak English, but my first language was Chinese, and, uh, and just, just disregarded and, and made, made to be invisible. You know, that, was, that was another factor I think we haven't mentioned, being invisible, not only just being the yellow menace uh, and model minority and, and all of that, you know, I, I, I I feel like I experienced all that. You know, I, I was the yellow peril. You know, they didn't trust me. They taught it. They teased me. And, and, and eventually that caused me to run away from my identity. I didn't like being Chinese. I ran away from my identity. I estranged myself from my family. 
You know, I, I told my mother, quit speaking to me in Chinese. I don't want to, I don't want to be embarrassed. I told my Chinese community, leave me alone. I don't want to be with you. You know, I want to be white. Being white in Mississippi in the 40s meant being a redneck. So, I, you know, I learned to be intolerant to people of color, even people of my color. You know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't tolerate other Chinese people. I see a group of Chinese, I'd run the other way. And so it was, it was a terrible life for me. I ran away from my identity most of my life. And it was, it was a terrible thing to me, you know, to go through that. And I don't want any, any other people of Chinese descent or Asian descent. That's why I work with them now. That's why I'm, I'm in the 1882 community. Yeah. So I, I have great feelings for all that. And, uh, and, but, you know, but I said I experienced that. I, when I was growing up, you know, I was told I was different. I avoided, taught in teas, and then when they finally let us in the schools, I became the smartest school, kid in the school there. And so that, that just earned me, made me the right to be left alone even more. They wouldn't tease me anymore. But all, under all of this, they all, I always had a feeling, look, Stan, you might be the smartest kid in school, but you're still just a damn child. Don't you forget it. And that's, and that's that was my place. And, and, I, and you know, I have... I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm mad about that, but I'm not, not mad necessarily about the people who did it to me, but that I tolerated it, and I was silent. And so I applaud, you know, what you all are doing and doing your movie and making these things known and, uh, and express that we need to speak out because we can't be silent and invisible anymore. Thank you. So, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Shout out to Stan, who's who's in our film, and and we we love hearing his story because I resonated with it. I grew up wanting to be blonde hair and blue eyed, and that goes back again to the societal constructs of who was popular, who is you know who is the the model on the magazine cover, who were the celebrities at that time. We've definitely made progress, but there's still a lot of progress that needs to be be made in thinking about these things and how we see ourselves and what we hold up as the standard. And I wanted to be black because I'm a rapper, and all my all my friends were all black. Uh, I was hanging out with; they were the cool ones because <laughs> I couldn't be popular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's something that I think thinking about all these issues. Yeah. When, like, you know, I'm I'm that long, I'll have no popcorn, but I count my chips. Why is that even a thing? Right. Do I understand 100%? Yeah. yeah. But then in today's racial sensitivity, you could be seen or criticized for having cultural appropriation, right? Like, so like you can't do anything right because you want to identify with something. We're just, just trying like, to make friends. I know. Right? Right? Like, I think everyone, so everyone in here, like, yeah, you were just trying to make friends. We just okay. all wanted to be like, right? I wanted to blend in. I, 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 didn't, I, didn't want to be, I didn't want to be the model minority. I didn't want to be the yellow girl. Ask that, yeah, that's a good question. Oh, are you asking me about rap? <laughs> is that appropriation for rap? About cultural appropriation? Isn't cultural appropriation? Bob Bowley is right? really a fun guy. It's, yeah, he's <laughs> also known as Wen Wen Wong. Wong. You don't even get my name wrong. Only one. Uh, I'm only one. I mean, I'm a hip hop artist, and I, a lot of my friends are black, and they love right. me, and I love them. But then, like. A lot of my black friends love martial arts. Is that appropriation right. too? Right. Yeah. right. I mean, like I'm like, being like abused for a Well, we, we oh. just, uh, this is another story because I taught my producer Tai Chi so he would teach me how to beatbox, right? <laughs> and he introduced me and Larissa together. So it was because of a very good black friend that we are married. So I mean. Jerome, what do you think? Yeah. I think it's, it's a question. Cultural appropriation is where you take something and then you profit on it. Mm. So it's not because anytime you have how, one of the questions that came up yeah. in my mind yeah. was, are there any Chinese blue singers? Uh, are, there, so, are there? Are there, are there any Chinese blue singers? Is there any? Like, do you know yeah. 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 in the uh, big jazz band, Terry, at the Howard Theater over there? So, oh. There was a band called the International Sweethearts and Rhythm. The lead saxophonist. Was Willie May Wong? Yes, right. yes. I need to talk with the Chinese folks in that. Thing. Since, right. since you talk about the, the Mississippi Delta, I said well, I've never heard any Chinese blues singers. Well, there came out of the Mississippi. Came out of the Mississippi. Must have been somebody who played 
Yeah. yeah. One night's something. But yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's one thing where you, uh, when, when you look at world history, you know, for example, you get centers of knowledge. In the case of Africa, you have Timbuktu, you have Kemetic society. People from all over the world came and cultures interact. Yeah. Uh, when you when you look at the Silk Road, when you look at the Nile Valley civilizations, you get this. Once you get these integration of trade, you get this integration of cultures. Nobody talked about it as appropriation. Yeah. And only once the construct of race comes into play, if we follow uh, Kende's book on uh, how, to, uh, how to not be a racist, once the, once race is created to perpetuate a system, then the question of appropriation. And so I think that knowledge grows globally through interaction. That's what, that's, what, that's what campus is about. So what we don't have is a model that, in the words of Tony Morrison, can we create a society where there are no others? No, and can I just piggyback off that? We need a black line to create that white center, right? If you have a blank piece of paper, you want to be in the center. You have to have a border that creates that center. And so why do we put black people on the outside? Why do we have this boundary, this smart boundary? Because everybody wants to be in the middle, but you gotta have somebody on the outside to have the middle, right? Isn't that kind of play on to what she's trying to say? Well, she, she, our, our view is that that's how you create the others. Right. But how do you how do you overcome that okay. to create a society? Where how do you are, blur that? How do you break how, that? How do you break that so there are no others? How do you create what is known in the literature as a cosmopolitan vision, yeah. where everybody can integrate in the sense of, of being authentic yeah. without this whole notion of being subjected to what we call racism. Yeah. You know, and do you semantic. think that's possible in this world, in our country today? Keep hope alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well I, think, I think, no, I, I did that facetiously. I, I think it is in one sense that if you, if you, if you look at what I'm understanding of the Chinese American experience, um, and if, if, you, if you look at the African American experience, one of the overriding issues is that in the case of African Americans and other groups, they're just, all they want to be is American. They want everybody to live up to the American ideal. But that's the only thing that's being denied. And so the question becomes how do we make that? How do we hold these truths to be self-evident? How do we make this a more perfect union? This becomes the it's still it is a still a guiding light for a lot of people, even though yeah. uh, sometimes light looks uh, dim. Now, and it is a threat now when we look at what's going on with the rise of the Talibization of America. With what we're trying to do is re reinstitute Jim Crow. Yeah. This is what the far right is trying to do, yeah. is re reconstruct that. And the question is, do we have the political will, the ability to organize to, to beat that back? Uh, because though Jim Crowism was stopped in the, the Civil Rights Act, the Anti-Immigration Act, 1964, 1965, the reconstruction or the re restoration of, of that model is trying to be put in place now. Yeah. And that, that's the real story. Yes. And part of what these stories help us understand is why we need to even fight hard. Exactly. Well, Larissa, did you want to chime in? Yeah, and, and I and I I definitely concur with a lot of Jerome is saying because I, I think what it comes down to also is just why representation matters, why having our stories included matters. Um, because you know. People will try to erase our histories um, and continue to marginalize us um, if we don't act, if we don't get engaged um, with keeping these stories alive and these conversations alive. And I think to that point of like Crystal, you know, will things change and how things, you know, how things will, you know, progress as we move forward. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the images that we see. It's the images, you know, and the people that we see. I mean, we want to see not just President Obama and Kamala Harris. That's a start. But I think those were steps already to to change the perceptions with a lot of people globally, you know, of of what an American looks like. Um, or or you look at the entertainment landscape. 
you have Oprah Winfrey and Tyler Perry and you have uh, Chris Rock and successful entertainers that are beloved or even somebody like Kobe Bryant who was loved in China, apparently really loved, um, revered in China. That, that didn't happen like 30 years ago. And so those are the types of things where we, we, are, we are helping to change the perceptions of people. And you know, on the flip side, because we're we're still only making a little gains with the Asian community in some of those civic arena and, and entertainment on a, on a global level like that, we are still perceived as the perpetual foreigner. K-pop can't be the only thing that represents us, you know, um, as far as being Asian. It, that's not Asian American necessarily. Um, I'm glad they're successful, but those are the types of things where we have to continue to, at least in this country, um, as we're talking about American identity and heritage, preserve our heritage, which I think is very important and not erase that, but at the same time, understand that those of us who are of Asian American are also fully American um, and that we do have a sense of belonging and agency here. And you're talking about representation mattering and it's a question of how, because like you say, we can all be out there, they check the box because we are under the K-pop you know, image and we don't have the nuances. But I wanted to draw attention to one of the uh, comments in the comment in the chat about this trending, very problematic uh, viral video in Africa. I don't know if you're aware of it, uh, where these African kids were singing this Chinese song and the Chinese taught them the song, which was very self-depreciating. It was actually something very, very um, insulting to their own people. And, and, and so these things are perpetuating racism and, and it is a global problem. It's not just a, an American problem. And we need to address the African-China relations as well as what we're doing here. And, glo and global capitalism. Yeah. We haven't had a chance to talk about that, oh but you, you can't. Part of this is it's, it's all related. It was uh, uh, just a switch a little bit. We're coming near the end of our time, but I want to give a little bit of a chance for you maybe to express a little bit about uh, uh, being a woman, a feminist, and you have that to look at, and you have this Chinese uh, other issue. Uh, I wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, especially thank you for that, Ted. Rest. So historically, women have been, we talk about Asians being silenced in this black and white narrative, but to dig deeper is that historically women, wherever, in whatever community you were from, don't get the chance to be spoken and heard. And if they are, they are in relation to their husband or their father or their son's story. We don't have our own stories to tell. And for me to have that um, effort to put emphasis on intimate histories. I feel like that's a different way of revealing history. What's a feminist way of approaching the world knowledge through a woman's story is, is incredibly important. And I'm, I'm just glad for that space. And I think that we should recognize that women's voices and stories have a lot to reveal about our past and our history. So thank you for that. The uh, 19th Amendment. Yes was passed the same year as your mother was born. Oh, wow, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, thank you. So we're heading to a time where we should probably begin to wrap up. Do we have any more questions from the audience? questions and what to ask the last couple of questions? Uh, so um, I thank you both for, um, um, for your work and really, um, it's interesting because I started my academic career doing oral history. My first oral history project was in the Delta. I interviewed the same people that you did about 12 years ago now uh, for the University of Mississippi um, at the at the Southern Food Alliance. And now with my research, I'm at the University of Maryland now, um, and I'm also Sonian. Um, I, I'm actually now because of my personal history for I grew up in Arkansas of that post-McCarran generation of basically the Korean grocers who then replaced the Chinese. Yes, that's another story. Um, and so my parents they moved to Little Rock uh, you know, to take over a grocery store in uh, Jacksonville, Arkansas. And so, so I'm looking at that next generation of newly arrived immigrants to the South. Um, and, th and, and this spans multiple uh, trajectories and histories from the Vietnamese refugees that are resettled in Louisiana to the Marshallese that are in the chicken processing plant of the Arkansas. Uh, Korean grocery store owners in Little Rock and, and, and other parts of the South. And, and, and I bring this up because I, I was interested to see if, if you were, as you were doing your research, 
if you begun to see the, the sort of as you're documenting the, the history to see what um, what you uh, seen um, um, of that of, of the of, of the next of the next generation, right? So so for a lot of the so for a lot of the families, you know, there there is this brain drain from, from the south that people moved away from the south. They come to DC, they come to LA, they go to Chicago. Um, and so I, I'm curious if you hear what you saw. And, and, and even within that period, there were also other um, groups, right? As as uh, uh, as Italians, there were Syrians, yeah, uh, Lebanese merchants. I remember having a great yeah, lunch at a Lebanese great. cafe in Clarksdale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Great. No. So I, great Lebanese then, food in yeah, Clarksdale. So I'm so curious to wow. hear if you had any or if you've heard stories in your in your work and your travels about how uh, the Chinese either yeah. work with or didn't know or or or, or, or I, 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 yeah. I'm also trying to keep those those yeah. those puzzles together of of Syrian merchants of of, of Jewish yeah, of, of, of Jewish folks or Italians yeah. um, of the Mexican Bracero field workers that were brought in. So I'm, I'm curious because as those groups also um, try to figure out the sort of black white dyad. I'm, I'm curious to see how. If you come across for those, I'm going to jump in quickly because, my, because I was just talking about intimate histories. And when my grandmother ran away, she was aided by her two girlfriends. One was Greek and one was, I want to say Jewish. I don't know because there was a department store in Augusta which was run by the Rubens. It was a long standing Jewish family. And so the connections of histories of immigrants and, you know, just the beautiful interconnectivities of people who cross paths um, historically because of whatever reason. Are exactly the things you're talking about and what we're talking about in the films. It's so um, yeah. Grace, did we in our in our interviews? I don't know if you're locked up with Doug. Uh, did we talk to? Other, I mean, yeah. Did we? I mean, John Bassey's in our film. He's Italian. He talked about how he, his family wasn't considered white for a while, and his family lived in that same pace neighborhood with black and Chinese. Was there others that we? Can you think of that we came across? Well, we talked with, I mean, we, we met several of the Lebanese families um, that were there and some of them had been there for generations. So, I mean, a lot of them were in a sense, like now assimilated in American, um, but, um, you know, they did recall, you know, grandparents, great grandparents having similar stories in terms of um, having, being, being in that, that space that wasn't quite, uh, that was not quite black or white. Um, but again, depending on the time period, everybody was in a sense labeled colored. Um, it didn't matter if you were Jewish, you know, you were labeled on that side, you know, the binary was black or white and you either belonged in those, um, you know, as long as you weren't white, you were considered black. Yeah, and uh, one thing we didn't talk about in our film was like, you know, Mexicans. Yeah, because they were also brought into the into plantation. Oh, Indians, Indians. Uh, yeah, and so I mean, Mexicans left their farm. Yeah. In Mississippi, it was yeah, it was it was Indians. The the next wave, right? Of and and their histories have been largely erased. And I and I wish we could have devoted more time to talking about that their story because it deserves to be told as well. Because there's some fantastic. If you if you haven't been down to Mississippi, I don't know if they have this in Georgia, but fried tamales, y'all. <laughs> are amazing. I don't know like regular tamales, but fried tamales. And that's how the conversation came up was, how did you get fried tamales in the South, right? And it was because the Mexican immigrants who were who were the laborers ended up bringing that culture to, to Mississippi. That's my grandpa. That's, oh, what? Wow. That's your grandpa? That's so fried tamales. That's my grandpa. That's how it came to America. And from the South, it's a great full circle. Exactly. You're at the pocket. <laughs> My mom chose to not speak it to us because she did not want to get passed by a dad being Mexican. Um, so this ties to what you just said uh, with the gentleman who was what the first year saw the Fidel program and the history that ties together. Um, so just wanted to put that in. It's exactly, it's true. My grandpa, he 
state of California, but he did go to the and he did work with them there as well. So it'd be interesting to learn where that intersects. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the, you know, both of you bring up a question I've never really asked before, because it's, we hear it all the time in the Asian community, like, we wish we were white. Like, now I'm hearing it from the, the Latin and Hispanic, we, we wish we were, did black, do black people in that era, like, did they wish that they were white as well? And it's a whole body, of, well, this is part of the past. Some, some, uh, yes. and not only that, there were some white people who chose to pass as black. Because right. that was they, they loved their mate, um, and they could not since you could not be legally married with people right, white. Right. They just declared themselves to be black. Interesting. But I, I wanted to, to leave uh, with two things in discussions like this. I, I say that there there are four narratives that we have to hold. There's a narrative of disorientation. What does this all mean? Then there's the narrative of loss. What are we moved by historical changes and so forth? And then there's, the, then there's the narrative of preservation. How do we hold on to, you know, what stories do we have to keep telling? And the fourth one is the narrative of opportunity. How do, how do we take all of this and then take us to, to the next level? So that, that's the first point I wanted to leave you with. But listening to this, you know, we all do these DNA tests. My daughter has a company, AfricanAncestry.com, oh, yeah. oh. yeah. and I know my African roots, yeah. so we can talk about that later. But there's also the admixture test. Comes back says you what percentage you are. Right, yeah. right. I'm 6% Asian. I was just going to say, yeah. like, maybe you have Asian blood. <laughs> That's crazy. Now, we just kind of dismiss that, because <laughs> we don't have right. no way of tracing it. Right. Now, I'll have to go back to my sister, who's in the family to see great. whether we can we can tease that out. How did six? How did I become six percent Asian? Yeah. My mother is sixteen percent. So somewhere along, yeah. We don't know where that came from. I want to leave a book recommendation on top of what you just said. If you all are interested, uh, Lisa Lowe's Intimacy of Four Continents, important book that brings together our different histories and why we're interconnected and where the flows go. Why were there Chinese that went to Cuba? What was the slave export? Why were Chinese also slaves we didn't know about? What did the African and Chinese relationship come from? It's beautiful, it's entanglement in its best. Mm -hmm. Four continents, Lisa Lowe, L-O-W-E. Yeah, she actually opens her book with a chest that she found at the NFA in Boston. So to add another layer, so I'm like, like I mentioned, I'm an academic, but I'm also a curator. And that she begins her book with this chest from the Philippines done by, it's done in the style of both African, um, sort of West African art, but also uh, chinoiserie style. And so she she blends all those things. She opens from that material. From, from a material yeah. called yeah. 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 food ethnographer. And I should note that my research actually brings people throughout the South through the lens of food and food production. Yeah. So Marshall East chicken processing plants, right, uh, Korean grocers, Chinese grocers, yeah. um, uh, Japanese chicken sexers, uh, you know, all of these so, uh, through the lens of food. And yeah, so, um, yeah, the materiality of yeah. culture it, through these flows. Yeah. So, Thank uh, you. so, one of the things we do is uh, we always like to leave a few minutes for us to just sort of maybe one minute and so forth. So, I want to do that. Uh, but I also want to go back to one of your thoughts. Because it used to be at one point you try to mix your internet and you want to learn as much as you can. And one of the key things for us to keep in mind is as we learn also to take pride in our own cultures. We don't want to elevate that in such a way that we become isolated ourselves, that we disrespect or we don't take an interest in the other people's culture. So that's sort of a, the reverse discrimination in that structure that says, I am going to uh, better than, say, my black clients and so like that. Or the black guys think that we should keep all the immigrants out because this or that. And then the other thing is that that is why we cannot really abide by the, the arguments that uh, we're not going to learn what the other people are. The more that you learn and understand what the other cultures are, the better you're going to be because you're going to have to you have better respect for that. That's that's the insidious nature of this argument about critical race theory, trying to keep things out of your education, and that's something that I just want to leave with people. That's my thought. 
want we want to transform hierarchies of oppression to hierarchies yeah. of opportunity. Exactly. And the more you learn, the more you learn, the more you can respect with the other people, the more the knowledge you have. And that that Asian American is not just in this world, but there, there's a huge amount. But the reverse of that is also true. You don't want to be so caught up in your own pride of your own tradition that you elevate that above everybody else's. So that's that's why we're complicating the narrative here, right? Yes, yeah. that's right. So you yeah. have a whole bunch of other clips in your your film just for you. I wish we had time to see that. But I would recommend all of you go see your film, Blurring the, Blurring color, the line. color Line. And remember, the color line is not one color line. We also have talked about all these other nationality groups. But remember also in Mississippi, there's a huge group of Choctaw Indians mm -hmm. that had a, a, a big impact in celebration of that. So we agree. Uh, Fall wind storm, it's moving along really great. Can you tell us what your, what your plans are? Oh, wow. There's a, um, yeah. Well, first of all, I want to thank Larissa for joining us. I know, I wish she was here with us. Um, she's really the uh, the brains behind Far East Deep South. Um, I would have, if it was up to me, it would just be stuck in a corner for our family and that was it. So thank you, Larissa, for having our back. Um, something exciting is going to happen here soon with Far East Deep South here in the DC area. Um, spoiler alert, uh, our film, hopefully you get to watch the film. I, hopefully the library here can pick up our film here so people can watch it yeah. here. But um, for Far East Deep South, there's a slight spoiler where there was a discovery of a Chinese Bible in Mississippi. That Chinese Bible will be put into the DC Museum of the Bible um, on August 6th. And they are gonna be borrowing it from the Mississippi Delta Chinese Heritage Museum, which currently has the Bible. Um, in, on display. It's going to go to the museum for six months, and we're going to have a, a big screening over there. We've invited um, the Black community, the Asian community, and everyone else. It's a very public event, um, and, and we're just going to try to celebrate how we can learn more about our history. I think that's a big, that's a big goal for Far East Deep South. It's really, we want to share an unknown part of history that'll, yes, we, we highlight some of the dark parts of American history. We can't get away from that, but for us to know the dark parts in all of our past helps us better understand our present day situation. And then we can use all of that to go and create a better future. And I think that's really our goal is like, how do we take all this stuff that we've never learned about and how do we understand how it came to be so we can do something better? So the 1882 Foundation, one of our, our really solid areas, uh, core areas we use to develop mess of lands. So some of the stuff that you guys are doing probably take your film incorporate into a lesson plan that any teacher, like any public educator can take on the show. Baldwin and Riverside have a great section of the work that you're doing that uh, flashlight. Yeah, flash yeah. 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 So Larissa, do you want to add to any of that? Yeah, um, just wanted to mention that we have a couple of initiatives and you know why we made the film was it goes back to education and not seeing our narratives in our history books. Um, you know, maybe you learn a little bit about Chinese building the railroads and then we kind of disappear from history books until Japanese incarceration in the 1940s. Um, and that is generally the extent that a history is told. Maybe just a sentence or two about the Chinese Exclusion Act for, for younger kids nowadays. But um, we feel like it's so important that this history is already being taught about the American South and about Jim Crow. And we just would like to have discussions also include not just the not just the impact on the Asian community, but also on Native Americans, on the Mexicans and other Latin groups that were also negatively impacted by Jim Crow. Um, and so um, if you would like to see our film included, incorporated in this discussion into more schools, um, please contact us. Um, let us school know about our film. But we also have this initiative called First Class, where we know a lot of public schools are underfunded and if you want to show our film at an underfunded school for the first time, let teachers know they can apply for this grant to have their film shown for free. We have a discussion guide. Um, and also, if you are part of any other organizations um, or even companies or groups that would like to host a screening, um, one of the things that we, we've done a lot is, is bringing together, um, just like we're doing in this setting here today, bringing together the African-American community and the Asian-American community and having these conversations and hopefully starting from a place of positivity and, and commonality um, and then talking through how we can how we can celebrate and tease out our differences and come together moving forward to the future. Um, so please uh, definitely reach out to us um, if you would like more information on our website, fareastdeepsouth.com.
Okay, so uh, uh, with, uh, let's, uh, I wanted to say that for 1882 Foundation, be sure to look at our website, 1882foundation.org, and there's a ton of stuff there. But I wanted to say also that uh, we, you participated in the last conference we had on Chinese American Food right. in 2019. And so we're going to do that again. Oh, that will be late uh, fall 2023. So yeah, Chinese American women. In this yes, program. raise the voices of women. So, uh, so uh, thank you all very much. Uh, I know that uh, you want to say a few words. I know the library has a closing time. Um, I want to thank uh, Wei, Mia, Vince, and Emily, our people who made this happen, who figured out the tech in this room. That was no small effort. Uh, and yeah, stay tuned, uh, dclibrary.org. We always have events. We're always, I think, open, have an open forum uh, for these kind of discussions um, and films. And we're very glad that you came came to join this discussion today. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes. We have time for one more question. So I kind of want to talk about the current moment we are in. You briefly touched on the rise of right-wing extremism, which obviously didn't happen overnight, but it seems to be accelerating. It seems like um, we're in increasingly precarious moment with, you know, voter rights being suppressed, um, history being taken out of schools, you know, the list goes on and on, violence, the list goes on and on. And what do you think, I mean, what do you think we can do apart from, you know, participate politically? What do you think is important going forward in trying to move this country forward instead of backwards? Well, I think the, the key thing is is right now is voting. Yeah. And then the other is mobilizing, creating those multi-ethnic, multi-racial, uh, instead of having a lot of single interest groups, see that you can really come together as a force that puts the demands to the politicians, right. other than just protesting in front of somebody's house, right. but to actually create a movement that recognizes the power of those who are indeed the majority and what the majority wants. And so we need a different kind of political vote. We need to vote, we also need a different kind of political mobilizing. I think, I mean, education, I think is really key for us. Um, we think that, um, I mean, Larissa likes to talk about how like, you know, it's like a family photo that's have been uncovered and that the corners have been folded and all of a sudden we open up we do this discovery and there's so many more people involved that's in this American narrative. And so for us to be able to come in and say, like, we're not trying to steal anyone's history away by including ours. We wanna to add to the history so that we can have a better picture. And for me, I was grown up with this whole idea concept of a melting pot. We just all wanna blend in and be the same, right? We wanna be all alike. But I think that's a horrible model because we don't want to be all the same. Like fondue is an ugly, weird, yellow, shady, beige color, right? We want to be like a salad, salad right? right? We want to have our individual flavors, but we don't want them separated. We don't want all the tomatoes here and all the lettuce here and all the cheese here, right? We want to mix it all around as I'm getting hungry right? yeah, to, show, to show the, Express, yeah, we need where, it. Where are they? <laughs> to show the, the beauty of a healthy salad bowl of America. That's what we, that's what I think we need, but we need education. We need everyone to know that the tomatoes exist and the leeks exist and that the carrots exist. We need to know we all exist. We don't want to pull them all out and be like, we just need to be one of these. We need to throw them all in. Right. I want to add one more thing to this. Going back to your question about bringing all the different generations together is that we need to provide opportunity and encouragement for the younger generation to create more content that's going to shift the narrative, that's going to shape and reframe and bring in these multicultural ideas that we have had in pre-existing conversations. Okay, so can I can I have a last word? <laughs> um, sorry, Ted, I'm over here. <laughs> um, just to add on to just to add on last word, um, I, I love what everybody said. Um, at the end of the day, it 
I think we have to do away with some of these really politically charged labels, whether it's CRT or ethnic studies. Sometimes that's the stumbling block and the, the political catchphrases that people get caught up in. And kind of going back to Baldwin's and, uh, you know, mentioning in my analogy of the photograph, it's like, it's not even adding in the history. It's just revealing the history that's always been there and discovering those family members have been part of your family. And you're like, I didn't know we had a cousin here and here and there. And yes, the table is going to be crowded a little bit for Thanksgiving, but we should invite them over. And, you know, Baldwin and I like to talk about dim, dim sum diplomacy. You know, this is how we break those barriers. Yes, it's about advocacy, but really it comes down to the human element. And we've seen it in the chat too, as we hear people seeing all these stories. I know, you know, it's, it's this thing where we have to have human relationships with each other. That's how we're going to break these cycles of stereotypes and prejudices against one another. And we've been, Baldwin and I have been so blessed to have so many friends of ours of different colors, but especially many times we're the only Asians in a room full of, you know, African-Americans, because that's, that's how we have why we're so passionate about these subjects because we want other people to experience the same thing we've experienced with the black community. And hopefully that's something that can spread. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I press this because the last time we were at the library, we got- She asked the last no, question. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> the last time we got chased out of the library by the guards. Okay. 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 So I- Four o'clock. Yeah. Oh, perfect, oh, yeah. perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thank all you. All right, so again, thank you all for coming. Our yeah, next event is you. going to be probably uh, next week where we do something about the uh, stereotypes and images of Ch Chinese Americans. That's not going to be here. That's going to be at our other place in Chinatown. But the other things that we're going to be doing are things like uh, the conference and so forth. But the, also, we have another plot that we developed. I think it's called Muscle Cars, Motorcycles, and Under the Hood in Chinatown during the 70s. Oh, <laughs> that's that's nice. oh. So anyway, <laughs> I thank you all for coming. I thank you all for our our, our feedback here. So much. And all of you for uh, Thank you all. See Thank you later. You. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.